and welcome to Candid Conversation number 56. Today we're asking the question, if there is a God, why doesn't he show himself? Why is he so hidden? Uh, that's a, a common question that unbelievers will ask. Funny that no one asked that about Satan, you know. If there's a devil, why doesn't he show himself? If there are angels, why don't they show themselves? And I, I think that people actually, it's kind of weird, but I think people actually have uh, less of a problem with there being a devil than they do with there being a god. Because if there's a bad guy, you can say, oh, I'm better than him. I can do better than him. Uh, so, you know, you're not threatened by him. In fact, you can use him as an excuse. You know, the devil made me do it. People have said that before. But when you recognize there's a God, well, he's above you. And nobody likes a perfect person. You know, it's just like the teacher's pet, you know. The kids don't like the teacher's pet, you know, because they look better than them. Well, you know, God's perfect, never sinned. People don't like that. It makes themselves look bad. And then plus, if there's a God, then they're going to be judged by him. And I don't like that either. So they'll say, well, you know, there can't be a God because he hasn't shown himself. Well, uh, regarding that, him being hidden, there are a few points to make on that. The, the main reason why... Now, God isn't hidden. Revela uh, uh, Romans 1, verses 19 and 20, we're told that uh, God has revealed himself to all people that the invisible things of him are clearly seen um, even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse so yeah you don't actually physically see God but he has shown himself Anybody, you know, nowadays you got evolution and that's what they teach the kids and that's what they believe, but it takes a lot more faith, if you want to use that word, misuse that word, to uh, believe in evolution than it does to believe in creation. The scientific evidence is not for evolution, it's for creation. The second law of thermodynamics says that creation goes for, or, uh, matter goes from order to disorder and the only way to get, you know naturally if nothing's done the only way to get something from disorder to order is by someone coming in and expounding energy to bring order uh, so er everything we see is like that uh, the whole world you know you put some this guy man he just he has a death wish, I guess. Uh, so, you know, for example, you put a load of clothes in your in your dryer, and then they and then they come out at the end. Every single time, they come out in disorder. It's just randomly bouncing around there. They never come out in the right order. A jigsaw puzzle. If you took a jigsaw puzzle, I don't care how many pieces it is, and you threw it down a staircase or just dropped it from a five-story building or something. It's not going to put itself together. Um, everything is like that. You just have examples in e everyday life. There are examples of that. And you just have to look. I mean, you just have to observe what's going on. So, when you see creation, and you see everything is in order. I mean, if the earth was farther away from the sun, we'd freeze to death. If it, if it was closer to the sun, uh, we would burn to death. No other planet in the solar system is inhabitable. You can't live on it. You know, we try to, the moon is the closest thing we've got. And they got to put on these space suits and uh, do all these weird things just to survive in the, at the moon. Uh, on the moon there for a little bit. Uh, what it shows is that if you just look at things objectively and you want to look at things scientifically, yeah, that's fine. 
then it's clear that there is a creator. Over in uh, first, I think it's First Timothy six verse twenty, talks about Timothy facing oppositions of science, falsely so called. Uh, so the scientific opposition, according to Scripture, really isn't scientific. It's falsely called that. When God appeared to Job, he gave a lot of details about this world that the scientific community at that time, and well, I should say at that time, a hundred years ago, didn't know. Two hundred years ago, didn't know. So, if you look at things by science, Science really is just knowledge. I think it, the word science just means knowledge. It's knowledge based on observation of the universe. Well, evolution isn't science because evolution says there was all this disorder and all of a sudden it all came together in order. Uh, that's never been observed in anything. So, just looking at creation, you can tell there is a God. It's clear to everybody. They have to look, blind their minds to logic and the truth to say that evolution is true or there is no creator. Another, so, but a big aspect as to why you don't actually see God is because of sin. God said, be ye holy for I am holy. He cannot, I think it's Habakkuk chapter 1 says, he cannot behold evil. So, if, if God dwelt with unholy man, it would mar God's holiness. He would no longer be God. So, he has to separate himself from us due to our sin. And then another reason for it is, you know, so in other words, before the curse of sin, you had, uh, it says in Genesis chapter 2, that God, the Lord God, walked with Adam in the cool of the day. So he actually appeared to Adam and, you know, walked with him every day. God's desire is to have fellowship with man. Jesus died on the cross when we trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for our sins, then we are reconciled to God, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And that's the whole idea why God sent Jesus Christ down on the cross, is so he could have fellowship with man. He says over in Revelation, he says to Israel, says, I will be their God and they shall be my people. He will be a son unto me, and it will inherit all things. So God's desire is to spend eternity with man. He created man. God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, it's Romans 5, 8. Then 1 John 5, 8 says God is love. So God has revealed himself to us in creation. And at certain times in history, Jesus coming, dying on a cross, the miracles that Jesus did, he revealed himself through the nation of Israel. And today, actually, he reveals himself through the body of Christ. Galatians 2.20 says, Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live, it says, um, I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's Galatians 2, 19 and 20. So God actually, say, why hasn't God shown himself? Why is he hidden? He actually has shown himself creation. Paul talks about that before uh, the dispensation of grace started in Acts 17. He said that the Gentiles, they were in the darkness uh, because they didn't have the Mosaic Law, they didn't have that light, but yet um, they could feel after God, we're told there in Acts 17. Though he, not, though he be not far away from any of us, 
So even when the Gentiles were in darkness, after the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11, God gave up on the Gentiles and he started the nation of Israel. And yet, and he, God gave him over to a reprobate mind. So even when God had given up on the Gentiles and they had a reprobate mind in Genesis 11, even in that status, in the darkness, reprobate mind, God's given up on them, even then, they could feel after him and he wasn't too far away because now they didn't have God directly speaking to them, God appearing to them, but they had Israel uh, showed that God was with Israel, that was clear there, and God showed himself to uh, through the law of the conscience, through creation. Romans 1, 19 and 20 says, the eternal power in Godhead, everyone knows about that so that they are without excuse. So God has shown himself to man, clearly shown himself to man. And in fact, today, although you don't see the miracles that Jesus did and that, you know, those things at that time, God is showing himself today more so than he ever has. Because John 4, 24 says God is a spirit. And that's another... Um, Another reason why we don't see God. Um, Moses asked, let me see your glory. And God said, no man can see my face and live. He showed him his back parts. So he did get to see, you know, partial God, but he couldn't even, here's Moses, uh, God's man, the most humble man on the earth. Uh, you know, the, the best man at that time in the entire world. And even he couldn't see God's face and live. But yet we're told over in 2 Corinthians that we behold with open face God. And we do so in his word. God is not hidden. You can see him in his word because God is a spirit. He wrote a book that is spirit. He's given believers the Holy Spirit to teach us the things of God. And so, the, as we look at God's Word, we behold God. Our spirit sees God through the Holy Spirit revealing Him to us as we read about Him in His Word. And we get to know God. Paul says in Philippians 3, that I may know Him. It's not just know about him. It's an intimate knowledge as like a husband and wife know each other. It's the same type of knowing that you can do with Christ by getting into his word, the Holy Spirit communicating God to you through his word. And and so God reveals himself to you through his word today. Now, for unbelievers, of course, they don't have God's spirit within them. They can't see God that way. But, as I mentioned before, Christ liveth in me. If I then, as a believer, I it says, ye are dead. I am crucified with Christ. It says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. That's 2 Corinthians 4, I believe it's verse 7. And so if, if I walk in the Spirit, if I allow Christ to live in me, then the world sees God through me. God, the Godhead, actually, Paul says that the Godhead actually dwells inside us. The Holy Spirit teaches us the things of God. The Spirit of Christ intercedes to the Father for us. The Father is with us. So, if, and since we're dead, and Romans 6 says to yield your, your body as instrument, your members of your body uh, unto God as instruments of righteousness. Uh, Romans 12 verse 1 says that we need to... Uh, <laughs> Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. 
So if I am obeying God's commands to us found in Paul's epistles, then I am learning God's word. I am, according to Ephesians 3.16, I'm strengthened with might in the inner man. So then that sound doctrine is built up in me. I yield my body as members of, of uh, righteousness to God. Christ uh, lives in me. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are his workmanship, created in, in Christ Jesus uh, for good works, which God hath ordained that before that we should walk in them. It doesn't say we do those works. It says that we walk in the works. That's because we are dead, our flesh, and Christ liveth in me. So Christ does the works through me. And so if I have yielded myself over to God and given my body as instruments of righteousness, if I... Uh, read God's word and believed it and I beheld it in open face and uh, seen God in his word then Christ lives in me and then people see God through me and it's just it's a genius plan it's something that uh, the Bible says that the wisdom of God is higher than the foolishness of man I believe that's 2nd Corinthians 1 maybe verse 25 or so the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Proverbs 8 says that when God created the world, created everything, He did so in wisdom. I mean, think about how hard that is to convey. Uh, the devil hasn't been able to do it. The devil cannot physically appear unto somebody and show his character or work through somebody in that manner. But God did. God is a spirit. No man has ever seen God and lived, you know, in terms of in this mortal flesh. He's in a completely different realm. Uh, granted, we are body, soul, and spirit, but because unbelievers, most people in the world are spiritually dead, there's no way that they can come in contact with God and live because God is alive in the spirit they're dead in their spirits uh, functionally speaking anyway and then their spirits then are would be destroyed they would have to be cast out of God's presence so that he doesn't mar the, his holiness and God is in a different realm there, there are uh, millions of angels there are cherubim there are seraphim there are devils, there is, of course, God and Satan. Um, all these creatures in the spirit realm. And nobody today has seen any of them. I know angels have appeared in, you know, before, and God has appeared in flesh with the person of Jesus Christ and uh, other appearances in the Old Testament uh, for certain purposes. But for us today, no one sees those things. And you may think, well, why doesn't God do the miracles? Why doesn't God show himself today like he did back then? He doesn't need to. Because really, everybody on earth can see God. First off, they see him in the creation, even the Gentiles in the darkness. Without knowing the gospel, without knowing God's word, they still see him in creation. Um... But now today, we've got believers who have actually have God dwelling in them, and then unbelievers somehow, and this is the miracle of it all. You think of Jesus, uh, what he did. He's God in the flesh. He took on the likeness of sinful flesh. He did no sin, but he took on the likeness of sinful flesh. And and so before, people couldn't see God and live. But since Jesus Christ took on the likeness of sinful flesh, they could now see God and live uh, because he is in a mortal body. He's in a, a physical body that is just like us. And so before, you look at when God appeared to Israel in Exodus 20, or in Exodus 19, there on the Mount Sinai, uh, the mountain burned with smoke. There was a fire upon it. They, it, it quaked. Uh, the people had to stand a good distance away. And they said, we exceedingly quake and tremble 
um, ask God to leave us alone. We don't want his commandments because he's going to kill us. Just being in his presence is going to kill us. And yet, approximately 1,500 years later, 2,000 years later, about 1,500 I think, God appears in a body, a physical body, and, and the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is able to dwell with man. Well, that's what God has done today. You say, oh, I wish I'd been around with the miracles with Jesus. God is in physical bodies today in the persons of the body of Christ, those who are saved. He is in our bodies. And so he dwells among men by dwelling in the saved members of the body of Christ. And then he does his work through us. And this is actually, yeah, I mentioned, you know, if I, why can't I see the miracles and things? You know, Jesus cast out devils. He healed the sick, raised the dead. You don't see that today. Well, God is actually doing greater works through us as the body of Christ than he did through Jesus Christ or through the disciples. Because 2 Corinthians 4.17 says, The things of this earth are temporal or temporary, but the things of God are eternal. Matthew 24 says, Heaven and earth shall pass away. Uh, 2 Peter 3 mentions how uh, the day of the Lord, when Jesus comes, you know, the f heavens are going to melt with a fervent heat. All the things in the earth are going to burn up. And so if God does a miracle, let's say he, there's an a infant that dies in birth, and God was to raise that infant from the dead, make his body whole. Well, at most he's going to live 110 years, and then that body is gone. In other words, the miracle that God did, which was just healing the body, is over in 110 years or less. It can't last longer than that. But because it's temporal, it's temporary. These bodies, whether we go up in the rapture or we are, uh, you know, die of natural causes or of unnatural causes, um, these bodies go away. They decay. They're gone. But when God does things in the spiritual realm, they're eternal. When God saved my soul by Jesus' death on the cross, He took my soul that was going to burn forever in the lake of fire, and He brought it into heaven. And Ephesians 2 says, we're seated together with Christ in heavenly places right now. And I am there for all eternity. That miracle will never be changed. It will never be reversed. It will never go away. And then as I read God's word and I come into the knowledge of the truth, that's the treasures of wisdom and knowledge that are hid in Christ. And those also will never go away because I will take those with me when I go to heaven in all eternity. And when Christ lives in me and others see that, Romans 5, 5 says, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. And so when others see the Holy Ghost in working through me, then they see God's love, they desire that, and then they are saved, they believe the gospel, as a result of seeing God's love, or maybe they come into the knowledge of the truth as a result of that, and so then there's a spiritual miracle done for them. And the spiritual miracle done for them is everlasting. So this idea about why is God hidden? Well, yes, he's hidden in that he can't physically show himself in his, all his glory to man because man is fallen. But the great thing about God is the excellency of the power of God is in every single believer. And man can see God through the believers. Not just in the physical realm, which is temporary, but in the spiritual realm, which will last forever. 
So why is God hidden? It's the contrary. God is well known. And it's only the eyes of unbelief that do not see this. 